Alrighty, so I'm lucky enough today to have Darius and James from the newly resurrected Sun Amps company here to have a bit of a chat about some of the more technical sides of the amp. So we're not going to be talking so much about the tones and the bits and pieces, but we want to find out the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts as to how they were sort of able to bring this old brand back to life for the 21st century. So gentlemen, thank you much, Lee, for coming along today and having a bit of a chat. Sure. Oh, you're yeah. very well. Thanks for inviting us. Now, one of the things that I sort of found interesting because I you know, follow the Sun um, Amp page, uh, sorry, the Sun um, Facebook group that's out there and also the posts you guys have done online and obviously you've sort of seen some of the press releases out there. You worked with a bunch of the original engineers from Sun, which I found I thought was really quite cool. What kind of insights did they give you into the original designs? And was there anything in particular that they said, you know what, I wish we had have done this or I wish we had have implemented this particular thing for X, Y, Z reason. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of stuff. We have, we actually met them kind of uh, as we went down the journey, not not early on. So uh, it was interesting to be able to bounce some of our ideas off of them, just in general, see what they thought of things and the direction and all that. So that was super helpful. Just general sort of design methodologies and 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 guidelines there. Both James and I come from, uh, you know, a, a manufacturing background when things were made in the United States and um, uh, kind of designed this from the ground up for, you know, reliability, designed for manufacturability, designed for testability and all that and, and repair, of course. That's actually quite, that's actually a really important point that you brought up there, the repair side of things. So. I know one thing that everyone is going to say, and I read about it all the time in the Facebook groups and all the forums and all the rest of that, we always hear point to point is better and tag strips and this and that and the other, but you've gone with a PCV design, which as someone who's done design and that myself as well, I'm a big fan of that too. So when you say repairability, what what, what kind of stuff have you done to keep these amps running for the long term on that side? Hmm. Um, for instance, on the beta lead, if you've ever repaired a beta lead, there's quite a lot of uh, wires to unsolder. Um, so we, we, we sort of fix that problem with, you know, connectors. Um, so you basically can uh, pop, the, pop the board out quite easily. Um, you know, these boards were, they were state of the art for the 80s, but they didn't have things like solder mask on both sides and things that make soldering easy, easy uh, you know, bomb proof rather than ending up with a short on the back of the board and all that. So, um, yeah, there was a number of things. And of course, safety, uh, especially with the tube amps, everything has to be uh, safe, three wire ground, all that with, with UL and, and um, you know, safety certification in, in mind. We went back and took a look at all that. It really, I mean, really, I think the only reason that we're still doing uh guitar amplifiers or some models of guitar amplifier with like point-to-point -point hand wiring is really sort of his mainly historical and mainly because people are just interested in in the art of having that done right when you look inside one and you look inside one that's done really nicely it looks kind of pretty um and so if that's the type of product that, that you like to own then i i think that's super cool and there's definitely a market for that um mainly what we wanted to do was get kind of cost effective products into the market and, and grow some and get it back to being one of the top five amp manufacturers in the world um, and to do that we have to you know make a, a good number of products and we have to make them um, cost effective and super reliable and the reason that people did point to point wiring back in those early days was because they didn't have solid pcb manufacturing capabilities and and now we have those and nobody would have done point to point uh, if they had uh, a, a solid PCB manufacturing process. And we've shown that um, we've done some comparisons with the PCBs in the in the betas from the 80s and the guys who worked on those designs. And then they've looked at what the modern PCBs look like that are going into the modern. And they're just, you know, astonished at how far um, that technology is, has come and, and the kind of quality. and. You know, in most cases, it's just going to be a better audio performance, right? You just have more consistency. You have uh, much, uh, much shorter um, circuit lengths. You have much better grounding. You have much better shielding. All of the things that you need for a good audio performance, you get from a PCB. Right. Yeah, definitely. 
<clears throat> but returning to what you were saying about the um, about safety and especially like the UL, which for those of us who aren't in the US, UL is Underwriters Laboratories, uh, which is like a you know safety and standards authority over in the US, similar to CE over in Europe. Uh, and here in Australia, we got the I can't even, AS, I think it is. Um, <clears throat> so one thing I noticed on the 100 and the 200 S is that it's got a polarity switch on the front. The original lamps, you know, you had your polarity switch for the quote-unquote death cap for switching between the active and neutral because the US, I believe you guys, up wasn't up until recently, didn't have a mandated uh, earth ground in your wiring code there, which is why that was kind of there. What is the polarity switch doing in the newer circuit? Well, that's an interesting question. So we, you know, we approach this from a historical perspective, wanting to really recreate the outside of that and... Um, as you pointed out, that that feature is kind of defunct. So we had sort of a brainstorm internally and said, oh, what what should we do with that switch? And we put sort of a, a an Easter egg of sorts on there, for lack of a better word. And uh, we're, we, get, we, we did some testing last week with some people that just heard the amp and they flipped it and they were like, oh, that's nice. So we've we've we put a useful feature on there. And no, it doesn't have a death cap inside these amps. So coming back to, you know the old versus the new, one of the key things of the original amps from back in the day, because they were based on Dynaco kits, which were, you know, your Hafler designed ultra linear output stage and all that kind of good stuff. And a big chunk of that sound is those big hulking ultra linear Dynaco output transformers. How was it to bring those back to life. How did you go about sort of replicating them with modern sort of processing materials and that? Was it a case of finding original old documentation and doing it that way? Or did you just get a couple of transformers and have them sort of pulled apart and assessed and re re rebuilt that way? Yeah, I'd say a little uh, sort of all the above. Um, the first thing we did was, you know, Hafler's patent is out there and, you know, patents had, I think back then, 17 year life. So that's all in public domain. So we studied what was done, especially with the winding geometry to get the low capacitance and the wide bandwidth needed for these for these ultralinear transformers. Um, we also got some samples um, and, uh, you know, did some measurements on those, checked them out. And then we engaged with a couple um, U.S. based transformer manufacturers, some that have been business a long time, kind of figured out what kind of grain steel they were using, made sure we could get that and um, basically had them take a look at the patent and see if they could reproduce this as, as closely as possible. And um, yeah, we've, we've, we've got them as one of our manufacturing partners now, and we'll be, we'll be making those, uh, I think it's the A, I can't remember the exact way, but, but we have the, the, the Dynaco straight out, specification straight out of the old Dynaco. I think it's a 1957 or something like that catalog for the Transformers. Awesome. So, so obviously you've gone to such lengths to sort of replicate it and all the rest of that. Does that mean, say, for example, if someone's got an old Sun Amp that blows up, would that new transformer just be a direct drop in for that? It would be, especially with the new line voltages, because in the US, you know, we went from 117 or 115 up to 120 in the mid 80s. So everybody's actually running their their transformers, uh, you know, off a bit, about three or four percent higher. Um, depending on the line voltage. So ours are actually spec to give the uh, old 50s output from uh, modern 120 volt. And that is that, that that is a big, big sort of key factor. It's very similar here in Australia where we've gone from around sort of 235-ish back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s to now being up to like 245-ish. So some old amps, Australia was well known back in the day for having amps that were designed by radio guys that weren't guitarists. So it was very common to have class almost B output stages and you get like a pair of six CA7s running 800 volts on the plates with half supply on the screen grids pumping out 80, 90 watts. <laughs> so when you plug modern 240 volts into it, or two, almost 250 in some instances, they tend to um, like to decompose themselves very abruptly. <laughs> yeah, and we, we found that a lot of the older designers design, you know, their, their filter caps were right on the edge and just close enough so that if you run it on modern line voltage, they're actually over voltaged. And that's probably the first thing that's going to go as a cap. So, you know, another, another thing that was interesting about the old Hafler, you know, design and that and the Dynaco kits was the phase inverter stage. So 
The original phase inverters, for those who don't know, back in the day used a 6A and 8 tube. It was kind of you know, different for a lot of sort of reasons in that it had a pentode that was used to drive a triode, and that triode was driving the output stage there in a cathodyne arrangement instead of like, say, for example, a standard long tail pair that you find in a lot of other high powered amps. I noticed on one of the Instagram posts that you made that there was a PCV laid out there that had six A and eight marked out on the board. If so, are you using the six A and eight as that phase inverter and driver arrangement or is it something else? Have you have you modified the circuit for modern components? No, not not at this point. We have uh, used the six A and eight, as you pointed out. That the, first of all, the pento, the amount of gain out of the pento driving that cathodyne inverter, is a real key part of the sound, along with the ultra linear uh, uh, transformer. Um, so uh, yeah, we've we've got a, a, a several sources for for NOS uh, new old stock six uh, A and eights. Um, most people don't know it's an interesting tube, although it's out of production now. That was um, pretty much the standard, at least in the U.S., in color TVs. Um, I think it, it was in the sweep section. And um, also Tektronix, before they went to solid state uh, oscilloscopes, a lot of the older Tektronix models uh, used the 6A and 8. So there is a, there's a significant number of, of, of NOS parts out there. And um, once we run that course, we have other plans for, you know, doing something similar to what you said. Right. So, because, yeah, because I know that there is a big, massive surplus, a surplus sort of um, stockade over in the U.S. We've bought parts previously for, for example, um, surplus sales in Nebraska, and they've got like a million plus tubes that is kind of sitting there. So it's good to see that those are still available and whatnot. And there's obviously a big sort of bunch of them to go in those amps. So are you guys testing them in-house or are you using someone else to test them before they go into the amps? We have to both and uh, we, we buy them hopefully tested, then we verify in-house. And then the final test, of course, is in the amp make sure they're not noisy or any kind of thermal noise weirdness or anything. So we do a burn in with those particular tubes in there. Cool. That sounds pretty promising all in all, because that, that is something that, you know, to, speaking of some other tech friends of mine and that, that we were sort of curious as to how that would be sort of implemented. Because I know a lot of other amp designs over the years that have sort of updated things and moved over to sort of more readily available tubes. But seeing a 6A and 8 in there is going to be, Definitely interesting. Um, another thing as well, obviously, when we're talking about updating things to modern components and modern circuitry and topology and that, the Beta Series amps now have a Class D output stage. That's kind of interesting because a lot of people sort of know, for example, with the old Beta leads and the Beta bases and the old GK stuff as well, like the uh, 800RB, a lot of that sound came from running that standard sort of Class AB linear output, uh, Class AB output stage and getting some of that sort of sag, that sort of compression and that sort of flavor from it. How have you gone about tweaking the circuit or implementing class D to keep that sort of tonal signature in the beta series? Yeah. Um, you know, early on when we looked at this, we, we played with a bunch of the preamp circuits and, you know, our take on it is, is that the, the tone of this amp is, is the preamp. Um, and you find that um, several people are using them with either crown, crown amps. There's some, uh, some knockoffs that, that use class D amplifiers so we really wanted the flexibility, the better efficiency, and all that. And it, we, we've done, uh, Mission has done a lot of FR, FR stuff in the past. Um, so we have about, I don't know, 10, 15 years of Class D experience. And our philosophy is these amps are, this type of an amp just needs sort of an SPL, um, uh, you know, right, it took the SPL, the volume to be raised. And in fact, when you push the class AB, I'm I'm sort of not a fan of that myself. It's it's when you start getting more complexity and blurring of the actual real signal if you push those too hard towards the top. So um, we made the decision uh, not lightly. We we know it's caused a bit of a of a firestorm on the web and all that. But we also talked with some of the old uh, uh, Sun Engineering team, and you know one thing we like to ask ourselves around here is. Although we're doing historical amps, we also ask ourselves, you know, what would Sun have done today? Um, and we believe from all the input we got from the ex-engineers and talking to other people in the industry that that was the right right choice. 
And uh, we, we put a lot of mileage on these, testing them. I'm actually using one in, in, in a band I play in. I've dumped my other amps and just really, really love the sound of it. Awesome. So, you know, with, with the beta series amps and the likes, they were unique at that time in the, how they switched things. They were using 4000 series logic to switch between the two channels. Is it still using that sort of old school way of doing things? Or have you sort of come up with something a little bit more modern, maybe like microcontroller or some such, or is it still just sticking to the old, old way of doing it? It's sort of in between. Um, we don't want to put a micro in there because of, you know, uh, having to put a clock, any clock above nine kilohertz and you have to go through all this certification. Really wanted to keep it all, all analog. But as you pointed out, there's one chip in there that is just not available anymore. And it's a, it's a 4000 series uh, combination uh, NAND, NAND or gate or AND and OR gate. Um, so what we did was we, re we recreated that logic um, in, in discrete discrete gates. So whatever you see that circuit in there, it's basically the same circuit. One improvement we made was um, those gates inputs were run to the output jacks. Um, so there were some, it could be potential ESD problems and all that. So we've, we've added opto isolation and, a, and a, a, a low current feed to that. So the actual input jacks are opto isolated. So we've got an opto isolator, then we've got the foot switch input. Um, and the nice thing is we designed it so all the voltage levels are the same. So that basically you can plug in an old 80s foot switch and it works with the old foot switch or with the new one. But we did have to modify that. And, you know, we didn't touch anything in the in the tone, in the path, in the signal path. But that's just one we couldn't uh, we could not uh, locate anywhere. Those those parts are gone. Yeah, and even, even then, a lot of those sorts of old sort of CMOS chips and various other things, even if you do get a big, massive NOS stash of them, you might get six months out of them. You might get 60 years out of them. They might be half dead when you pull them out of the packet anyway because yeah. they are so incredibly sensitive. So it's it's things like this, the upgrading and sort of bringing the designs into the 21st century that, to me, makes a lot of sense, sort of keeping to the original heritage of them but bring it up to modern sort of design specs. I was going to say the interesting thing on, on the CMOS to expand on that a little bit more since you're kind of a tech channel and you probably have a lot of builders out there. The 4049 and the 4069 unbuffered parts, which dates back to the, I think it was either late 70s or 80s application note 88 out of National Semi that told you how to make an amp, a linear amp out of these and spawned like the tube sound fuzz and several other circuits. Um, those are still made in the unbuffered version. Uh, you know, these, they're not new old stock. And uh, it's kind of cool that you can still buy those and they're, they're still uh, well supported by TI and other, and other manufacturers. Wow, awesome. Actually, with, with like with all that kind of stuff, you're going back as well to what you're saying about the Class D stuff, because obviously, you know, you're from mission engineering. I've had experiences with your products previously. Um, with the Class D that's going on in the beta and also the FRFR cabs that you got for the new Sun range, are those using off-shelf modules or are these in-house designed modules for use in these products? Um, so in the past, we've used off-shelf, and, um, and we, are, we are looking at transitioning towards modules because um, probably better performance than, than our off-the-shelf. So the, the Class D stuff, I realize it gets a bad rap, but if you look at the last 10 years of Class D uh, advancements, um, they're just, there's some amazing things going on with the, you know multiple closed loops around the thing, getting them to behave a lot more like an analog front end where they go into soft clipping and don't do strange things. So um, we, we kind of track that. Our philosophy is use the best technology. Um, if there's a new chipset out there, we'll get it into, into uh, R&D, you know, build some prototypes with it, play around with it. And if it makes sense, then we, then we ramp it out into production. So we like to stay current with whatever the best in class of, of any of the parts are that we're using. Yeah, mainly we're gonna make sure that um, we need to be able to build these products cost effectively and, and make them available in large quantities. And so if we can get a, a, a component um, or a module somewhere that does the job and passes all of our requirements and uh, sounds the way we want to sound it, then, then we'll do that. And then where we can, then we'll do our own. Um, some of the mission products, uh, some of the Class D mission products have our, have our own amps in them. Um, those were, um, Darius designed those, right? They, those are our own amps because back then when we were doing those, there just wasn't anything available off the shelf 
that had the same sort of sound quality that we needed and had all of the different interfaces that we needed and we could interface into the analog um, crossover that we had and so we ended up doing our own. Doing your own is much more expensive um, and less flexible, right? Each time you want to do a different power output, you've got to relay out the board and redo the design. Um, and so if we can get an off-the-shelf module that's of a really high quality and meets the requirements, we'll do that. And then where we can't, we'll do our own. Excellent. One thing I noticed as well is obviously you've got the beta lead and the beta base. You've got the preamps as well in the same form factor as the original heads. And going back to what you were saying before about how people, like I think it was um, Kurt Cobain, used the beta lead into the crown power amp and then into big massive cabs. Is that kind of one of the reasons why you kept them in that big sort of format for the aesthetic and that, or what, what, what was the reasoning behind that one? I think aesthetics, yeah. I think yeah. Go ahead, sorry, go ahead, James. No, sorry, I think we're in agreement on that. It was aesthetics. We wanted to make them look the same. Um, and you'll see that we've kind of split the products out into what we call uh, Sun Historic and Sun Modern. Um, and Sun Historic for track the original designs very closely. Um, and try and look the same and have the same aesthetic. And uh, in a lot of cases, that's required that we do a lot of custom manufacture, right? We've got to do custom knobs because uh, those, are, those are not made anymore. Uh, we've had to recover the tooling for the Tolex um, and, and get that done. Uh, the grill, grill cloth on products that have it, that's had to be reverse engineered from that's no longer made. So we've pulled old ones apart and figured out what all the threads were and we've recreated that. Um, so but that's very much what's in the, uh, the DNA of the historic line. Um, and then as we look at more of the modern products, those ones are going to be ones where we say, well, we really don't need to go to those sorts of lengths. These are things that are going to be smaller, they're going to be lighter, they're going to be, in, in many cases, uh, sort of use a lot less power. Uh, they're just going to be much more efficient and uh, easier for people to use and carry around with them. So that's that kind of split between Sun Historic and Sun Modern. And the original Sun Betas fit firmly into that Sun Historic. We want them to look and sound as close as possible to the originals. And then later on, there'll be some beta products that we're looking at that will fit into the modern line, and they'll be sort of smaller form factor. Yeah, oh, very exciting on that one. That one, that one will be cool. Now, you're saying you've gone through so much effort to sort of source, um, you know, the ability to remanufacture parts that are no longer made. So things like the knobs, things like the Tolex, the grill cloth, all of that. I know that when there's people out there who are restoring vintage amps and whatnot, getting a hold of these parts has always been an absolute nightmare. You've got to wait until one's scrapped or something else out there, or you've got to find kind of whatever you can to just sort of get by with whatever you can. Uh, yeah, it, it would it be possible, say, for example, if someone has an old, uh, you know, 200S or Serato or something along those lines and needs those kinds of parts, will you make parts like that available for them in future, keep those old amps sort of running? So we, we plan to make parts available where, where it makes uh, sense to and where we're not restricted. Um, so something like knobs, for instance, I don't see any problem with that. I, I would expect that we should be able to do those. Um, where, where it's possible. Sometimes you have to be careful that uh, maybe the, uh, the pots that we're using now may be slightly different to the originals and therefore you have to figure out whether they're going to fit on the older ones. Um, a lot of the information and a lot of the sort of supply chain management on those older units is not very consistent. Um, so you could look at one that was from 1980, one that was 1983, one that was like later in the year 1983, right? and they could have different parts in them, um, depending, and then whether they've been modified over time and those kinds of things. So you have to be cognizant of that type of stuff. Um, and then also some of the uh, some of the components, like the Tolex, for instance, I know a lot of people are really interested in that. That's covered by the license agreement. So that won't be something, at least initially, that we'll be able to put on anything other than something that's Sun branded. But where we can, we'll definitely be offering parts so that um, people can help keep their old Sun gear working. Awesome. That is definitely good news because I know a lot of people are always sort of a little bit wary when companies and brands get resurrected. It's like, oh, yep, yeah, cool, here, we're going to play on the nostalgia of it and bring things up. But it, it honestly sounds like you guys are genuinely sort of focused on, you know, honoring 
the way things were and keeping things going in sort of like the modern context and little things like that definitely build up some goodwill with sort of the people who've been fans of the brand. Um, yeah, just sort of, it makes a lot of sense to someone like myself because I see a lot of products out there that you can't get parts for, you can't get aesthetic bits, you can't get anything like that to keep them kind of going. And it's a shame. Yeah. Yeah, that's another reason why doing something like the beta and keeping it in that same form factor, um, even though it's a slightly bizarre form factor and you would have thought, well, we'd make everything 19 inch rack standard, even if you were going to make it that size or we make it in something much, much smaller. Um, by doing it that way, we can share some of the parts. So, for example, getting hold of a replacement head cabinet. Um, if you've done a Kurt Cobain to yours and there's a big chunk missing out of the front um, or some other reason that it got damaged and you need a replacement, you'll be able to use one of our uh, modern ones and your old beta will fit in it. Brilliant. Speaking of cabinets and all the rest of that, now comes the fun part about chatting about some of them because you guys have got to be about the only company I can think of other than maybe Ampeg and some of the others that are doing some of these big, hefty, massive cabs like the 215, but the 215 is really, really conservatively rated on its power. Like most people would think it's almost underpowered in today's era of, you know, 400 watt per driver, big behemoths and your things like your mark bases and all the rest of that. So those new drivers, especially the 215s, how did you go about bringing them back in? Was the aim to keep them in that sort of lower power range so that they're being run almost to their edge? And what what ones in particular were you sort of going about bringing into the modern world? Was it a case of getting some old drivers and, have, and sort of like recreating them? Or was it like a new version of something in that tonal sort of mold? Uh, so this really comes down to the difference between uh, Sun Historic and Sun Modern. So the, the 215 cab, which you mentioned, is a Sun Historic product. So the goal for that is to make that as close as possible to, uh, to what the original was. Um, and you think back in, back in the day when these were created, there weren't really bass-specific drivers and guitar-specific drivers and uh, home audio-specific drivers and pro audio-specific drivers and all of those different ranges that, that, we have, uh, that we have today and we can choose from. Those, those never really existed back then, and so most of them were kind of full range drivers um, in terms of going from somewhere sort of five, six, seven K, something like that, or seven uh, hertz down at the bottom end, right up to sort of five K, even more in some cases. Um, and they were really designed for the sort of more full range type applications. Um, there's, there's no driver like this that's made today, I don't think, I know, um, Weber had one at one time or another where they'd kind of reverse engineered the original JBLs a little bit, although they switched the magnets out for neo magnets instead of ceramic magnets, which had a bit of a difference. One of the unique things about them is the aluminum dust cap. Um, and that has a very distinct, adds a very distinctive uh, effect to, to the tone, um, but it also significantly limits the power output because the aluminum dust cap, if you run too much power through it over a period of time, will get very brittle and shatter. Um, and so if you look at these uh, aluminum dust cap based drivers, they tend to have much more conservative power rating. But then you look at what it's really designed to work with. Um, the 2x15 was, was what was shipped with the, with the 200S. Um, and we're supplying the original 200S and we wanted to supply the original speaker cabinet with it. Um, and so that's what that does. The drivers had to be recreated from scratch. So we've worked with uh, engineers Eminence and we've reverse engineered the JBLs um, and we've created a modern version of that 15 inch driver. So it has all of that audio uh, characteristics of, of the original and it has that really nice look with the big shiny aluminum dust cap. But the trade-off is it doesn't have anywhere near the power handling of a, of a more modern uh, speaker driver. And that's when you go to uh, the, the modern line. So when you look at something like the 2x12, for example, I think that's a 400 watt cabinet, something like that. So that's something that you will use for a more modern application. Our expectation is most people that use the 2x15 are going to be using it with the 100S or the 200S, which is a 65 watt amp, and you've got plenty of headroom there. 
Right on. <clears throat> so you're going for the JBL variant of the cab instead of, say, Sun's own in-house drivers for this particular one. Was there a particular reason for that? Yeah, well, this, that's, a, that's a very long and interesting story about, um, about Sun's, uh, Sun's own speaker manufacturing process. That was something that was done in the, in the Hartzell years. So this was after uh, uh, Comrade Suntholm had already sold the company on. Um, and they were looking to ways in which the, that they could expand the, the business and how they could bring more of the manufacturing uh, in-house. Um, they had built a pretty decent sized uh, speaker factory in, in Kentucky um, and were doing speaker driver manufacturer in-house there. Um, but that was a, a period of time that was much later than the 100S, 200S. Um, and so we wanted one of those original cabinets to go with those. Um, and then, uh, you know, eventually, of course, that Kentucky factory shut down and they didn't really uh, do any more manufacturing out of there um, before it transitioned to Fender. So the, the, the sort of sun manufactured um, speaker drivers were a bit of an, an odd phase in sun's life. And I don't think there was anything there that we particularly wanted to recreate at this time. Yeah, certainly. Def definitely, definitely makes sense on that side because the one that everyone's always after is they're always after the one loaded with the JBLs. That's kind of like the tone that people think of. It, yeah, it's a very, very distinctive driver. Um, it's, it's quite heavy. It's uh, quite expensive to manufacture and it also has that trade-off with what the power handling is. And so you, do, you, just, don't, you just don't see that sort of driver uh, used anymore for those reasons, which is it's a shame because it has a really nice sound and we're glad to bring it back. Yeah, and it's super sensitive, right, James? I mean, it's... it's uh... Yeah, it's like 98 dB or something like that. It's an extremely sensitive, sensitive speaker driver. So it's very, it's, it's very efficient. So you, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's plenty of SPL out of a 65 watt yeah. 200S with, with one of these 2x15s. I mean, nobody's going to go, oh, it, is, it isn't loud enough. It's not something you're ever going to hear anybody say about this. Quoting a bass player that was over the, uh, testing one of them, he said, this is the first bass amp that actually scared me. He turned the knob a little bit too far. It does, it does, it really outputs a lot. And, you know, it's it's interesting because, you know, off on a bit of a tangent, but the trend in, in bass drivers has been these long throw drivers, right? Sort of like big pistons, which necessitates the need for a 2000 watt bass amp. But when you go back to these old school uh, designs where, you know, they were just moving air uh, without a lot of travel and they make them very high sensitivity. It's, it's, it's interesting to experience that again, because you really get hit, hit right in the chest with a full wave. It's pretty, pretty cool. And this is something a lot of people sort of don't understand. When we're talking about sensitivity in decibels, that's basically a measurement of how efficient a speaker is. So, you know, it's X amount of decibels at one watt at certain frequency, X amount of distance from the speaker itself. The higher the number, the more volume you're going to get out of the same power in there. And it's like that trade-off as well. As a lot of people think, oh, you know, I've got to have a 100 watt head. I've got to have this. I've got to have that. But the reality of amplifiers that you know, people like us know is that it's all logarithmic. So a one watt amp is half the power of a 10 watt amp, which is half the power of a 100 watt amp. Therefore, one watt is theoretically a quarter of the power of a 100 watt amp. So these amps being 65 watts still has a lot of punch. And I imagine paired up with this cab or even the 412 is still going to tear down walls like all of the sort of fans that are really after this kind of product are going to want. Uh, I think so. I mean, one of the things that you don't really see talked about all that much is how much of the sound comes from the speaker cabinets. Everybody's interested in amps and they're interested in amp technology and what type of tubes it has and what type of topology it's using and, and whether they swap out one tube or another and, and the tone stack and different variations of the tone stack, those kind of things. Um, but those are often very small changes in sound compared to the, the change in sound you'll get swapping out uh, different speaker cabinets. Um, so you can take the same amp and use a different type of cabinet with it and, and massively change the sound. Um, the other thing is just the amount of air that it moves. So if you're standing in front of one of these cabinets, when you think these were used as, these were, there were no PAs, right, back in the, in the day when these were created. So these were responsible for providing what we would today call backline. 
right? So you look at, look at a Hendrix or a Who type of installation, right? And they have maybe three, four, five different amplifiers and six or 10 different speaker cabinets. Um, you imagine standing in front of one of those setups and feeling how much air those things move. It's an uh, incredible experience. When you, when you play one of these for the first time, when you're standing in front of them, there's definitely a very unique experience about feeling that much air being moved. Definitely. With, going back to that, all those cabinets were used for touring bands. It's reasons why, for example, The Who, when they went over there, picked up the Sun Amps because they were more reliable than what they were using whilst they were doing that. With those cabs, there the old ones were rock solid. They were pretty much bulletproof. Have you sort of stuck to doing like a one-to-one -one clone of them, or has there been some sort of like modern updates and changes to like uh, manufacturing to make them more robust or rugged, maybe cut some of the weight out of them? Um, was there anything done with, say, for example, the small volume parameters inside to change the frequency response to make them a little bit more oomphy, I suppose some people might say? Uh, so it depends on what the uh, depends on what line we're talking about. So if we're talking about uh, Sun Historic, we talk, try and keep them as close to the original sound as possible. Um, I mean, back in those days, they weren't really measuring feel small parameters, and at those point, they certainly weren't putting in uh, anything very sophisticated in terms of, of porting cabinets. Um, this does ha have the two by fifteen does have a port of sorts. Um, but it was, um, it was an idea in somebody's head, it was never really measured. Um, and so part of the work that we're doing is to, is, is to measure this uh, cabinet and duplicate it as, as closely as possible. When we look at the, what's in the modern line, so that we look at the 2x12 for example, um, that has been engineered to get a very specific sound out of it and to get as much efficient efficiency and more power handling capabilities and, and those kind of things. And then we've tested it with all of the different amps to, uh, to get where we need to get in terms of, of the sound. So again, depends. If it's historic, then we try and make it as close as possible to the original, even if maybe some of it wasn't ideal from a, um, from a flat response measurement type of standpoint. Whereas the later ones are um, engineered uh, to provide very specific frequency characteristics. Well, this is something I've usually sort of said to people as well in the past is that guitar amps and guitar cabinets are terrible from a design standpoint in terms of frequency response, in terms of what they do. It's just, yep, cool. Here's a square box. Let's put some speakers in it. But it sounds good for guitar. It narrows everything. They're built robust in the simplest way of doing it, but you're not going to get any hi-fi kind of response from it. However, in saying no. that, you do have the monitor speakers as well under the Sun brand. So, you know, for example, myself, I moved over to digital a couple of years ago and the likes. I still use sort of like a traditional cab for my own sort of personal monitoring and listening, but sometimes I do want to hear kind of what it sounds like directly from, from the monitor with that kind of stuff you know what sort of what were the main things you were going for when bringing this sort of like modern technology into something like the sun brand that was sort of like known for a less than kind of hi-fi sound in sort of you know, that kind of regard well I, I mean i think sun was only known for that simply because it uh, it, it ended um, when it ended, right? So um, when when we didn't see Sun anymore and it went for 20 years, that, that's the period of time that we're talking about when, when we have modeling and cabinet simulators and those kind of things. They didn't really exist in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Now, in talking to some of the original Sun folks about what they were planning and the, the, the types of products that they were developing, some of those very end sort of Sun products, they were starting to look a lot more like monitors. They were taking the power amps out of the head and they were putting them in the speaker cabinets like, like we see now, right? Some of, those, some of those late models, that's what they were starting to do. They were starting to do wider frequency responses, starting to look at the possibility of doing things like the early class D amps and those kind of things. That's what they would have done had Sun had continued. And that's our sort of what would Sun do now mantra. They would not still be just making 65 watt tube heads and two by 15 cabinets, right? If they had continued all through that time, these are the sorts of things that, that they would be doing. So we wanted to make sure that we covered that too. 
um, both from a standpoint of providing products that people would use now. I mean, it, you, you used to have trucks and roadies and stuff that were necessary to move these big things around. We don't have those anymore, not unless you're the Rolling Stones, right? You can't afford to do that any longer. And so we're all carrying stuff around on an airplane in our backpack to go play shows, and you can't do it with this stuff. So we want to make sure that we're reflecting the sun lineage, um, but that we're also providing products that modern players can use. So you've got these new monitors. They look cool. You know, I, I, I like, I'm, like I said, I'm a big fan of sort of those full range speaker drivers and similar setups. They're 100 watts. A lot of the others out there are much, much higher sort of power. I've seen a couple of posts online about people saying, oh, 100 watts isn't enough for me. I need at least 400. I need 700. I need, you know, big, massive things like my Matrix rack, like my Seymour Duncan power stage. What is, you know, what, what, what would you say in regards to that? Because in my experience and my knowledge, 100 watts run clean through some very, very high efficiency speakers. You're never going to need to turn it up past a little teeny tiny amount. Right. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a couple of things on that, right? The, the first one is those we talked about this earlier about whether you use whether you would use off the shelf products or whether we use custom designed amps and those kind of things for particular products. So when we're looking at the, the full range products right now, the, the Sun FRFR products, these are all designed internally. So this is taking advantage of our experiences, Darius said, of 10 plus years of, of developing uh, these products at Mission. Um, so all of these parts were custom designed to work together. So the drivers are extremely efficient, the power supply is extremely efficient. We custom built the amp to work inside this cabinet and tuned the cabinet to, to get the most efficiency and the best low frequency response out of it. So when you have that amount of control, you really don't need a thousand watt amplifier to play most applications. Um, I mean, these are not PAs, right? These are, do, these are on stage monitors and these are things people use at home and in the studio. Um, there are some bands that use the Mission product, right? Bands like uh, Yes and uh, some of, the, um, some of the, the Pink Floyd tribute bands that are pay, playing to like tens of thousands of people in outdoor uh, arenas and stuff like that. And they use just one two by 12 or a couple of one by 12s on stage as a monitor and that's all they need um, you just really don't need that sort of number um, if you've designed the whole of the all of the elements in the signal chain yourself and you have full control over it now if you don't right if you say well i'm, I'm sort of tied to using this particular speaker driver because i'm buying an off-the-shelf driver from from jensen or from eminence or or Celestian, and it has a certain efficiency, and then I'm using an off-the-shelf um, power amp stage from somebody, and then I don't have full control over the crossover because I have to use digital, and that has limits with to, ha to how much distortion I can deal with, those kinds of things, then um, you probably need more power amp to, uh, to deal with that. Um, and then there's also just the, the marketing standpoint. Right? This is just, hey, mine's better because mine's 700 watt. And so the next guy goes, okay, I'll make mine 800 watt and then mine will be better. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think to your point, uh, it was designed sort of from the from the end of the system back. So, you know, we, we've given a nice, efficient driver, as you said. How much SPL do we want that's useful on stage? Give it some some headroom and then calculate how much power we need. And I remember when we first talked about this, um, this was 10, 15 years ago, we mentioned power levels and everybody, oh, it won't be loud enough and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think it was, I can't remember what which magazine, Premier Guitar or one of those, they, uh, the reviewer said, basically, this thing will roast your pants legs off. It was, uh, it was plenty, <laughs> plenty loud. And uh, yeah, so yeah, and again, you know, you, you've got it. It's a, it's a system level thing. That's what we always tell people. One of our guys, his, uh, his famous saying is, how loud is a 100-watt light bulb, right? I mean, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> It's and look, that that is that is so incredibly true as well. Because uh, you know, a little bit of a sort of throwback to me when I was younger. I used to work selling vacuum cleaners because in Australia we have a retailer that's been around since the '30s that just sells vacuums. People would always come in. Oh, I want the 2400 watt jobby. It's like, why do you want a higher power bill? 
what about the efficiency? What about everything else in the system that's going to make it do what it's going to do? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. Right. So, you know, another question as well that I've gotten from a bunch of other people, especially down here in Australia, is, you know, international availability of the products and, you know, if that's something on the horizon. And if so, what sort of, what's it like designing a product to be able to be used in multiple different areas? Because you've got UUL in the US, you've got CE over in the EU. God only knows what the UK is going to have now with the whole post-Brexit thing. And then you've got somewhere like Australia and New Zealand that has their sets of standards as well. So, you know, how how much extra and how much how much more difficult is it to be able to make a, make these products for those other regions? Uh, well, it depends where you come from, um, and it depends how much money you have. So uh, the first challenge is it's expensive, right? Do, doing these types of certification, e even if you you're experienced doing it and and you have the access to the labs that are necessary and those kinds of things, um, is an expensive business. Just so that those lab resources cost cash. Um, so you've got to be able to, uh, to to do that, and so I think we'll see um, we'll hit the main ones um, from the get go, and then we'll add additional ones as time goes by. Sometimes it's something that the distributors can help you with in particular um, particular locations um, where where they can help with that. So we'll, we'll definitely be making these product. They were designed originally to be approvable. I mean that that's the first that's the first step this was this was in our head right from the beginning uh, we knew that we were going to have to do this so every element of the design we've taken that into consideration that, hey at some point this has got to go and get csa certification it's got to get tub it's got to get ul um, so that kind of stuff was taken into consideration um, the other thing is that this is the background that darius and i come from so darius is xhp i'm x intel um, between us, we have taken thousands of products through safety certification over the last 30 years, so we kind of know how to do this stuff. Yeah, and we, we, we engage with the lab early on in the design phase because nobody wants the surprise of taking it in and failing and, uh, oh, now we have to redesign or change the clearance between components. So there's been a couple of discussions with them about, hey, we want to take this global. Is it okay to do X? And uh, yeah, so we're always we're always looking towards that. So if you're looking at sort of the international market at some point and the likes, I assume that the, the switch mode stuff that you've got there, the class D stuff is sort of universal input voltage and the likes. The transformers on the two amp heads though, are they individual transformer by voltage or is it a universal primary? They are individual by voltage for now and um, not sure if we'll go universal pri primary. So we probably will be, you know, building them re regionalized for, for your region. Fortunately, uh, if unless it's changed in the last couple of years, it's it's quite easy to deal with Australia and New Zealand. Um, you get an agent there and they hold your paperwork and uh, they make it a lot easier than going to Europe and Japan and some of those countries where it's super difficult. Hmm. Australia is a, um, a self-reporting country. It pretty much comes in, make sure it's all safe, make sure it's not going to shock anyone and you got the ground connections in the right spot and a few other things. You're good to go, which is excellent. And I suppose that takes me on to one of the big questions that I know everyone is inevitably going to ask because, yes, it's always the first question when it comes up with anything, son. Model T. Model T. What are the sort of – what are the big challenges and hurdles that you're currently sort of dealing with in getting these made for – the modern manufacturing realities and the modern sort of world of people buying 100 odd amps because I'm sure the market for it is much much smaller than it was in 1967 there's not many people buying those kinds of amps no, that, that's exactly it right and I, I think we we were looking you could look at this about how two different ways that we could have grown this business right one one is to start very small and say okay well let's let's do the model t because this is one that has a lot of popularity with a very specific but very small group of people and, and is also you know a complicated and expensive amp to to rebuild um, and you could sell that where you can to that small community and grow very slowly um, and the reality is if we had gone to fender with that proposal and said this is what we're going to do we're going to make a handful of uh, exact replicas of the Type 1 Model T 
and we're going to sell it to uh, the folks in the doom music community and um, they would have told us to get out of their office because you know that's what brought about the downfall of sun last time right that was the product that fender sold it was a i mean it was a slightly different version right of the model t but that was the product that they sold it was an excellent amp uh, no question about that right but it, it brought about the death and the 20 year shutdown of sun um, we're not going to do that um, we need to get the business up and running and we need to get it selling and supporting products that are useful to many many more people and then once that's happened we've got a bit more wind in our sails and then we can do some of these more specialist products like the model t and what we really want to do with the Model T is make something that's available to a wider group of people. So the Model T will be a group of amps, it won't just be one. Um, we'll have something that will uh, be as close as possible to the original, kind of something more down the historic line, but then we'll also have modern T, modern versions, um, which are products that are more suitable to the modern market and we can hit a better price point where then will be smaller and, and much more efficient. So, so the little baby lowercase Model Ts then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. Because, yeah, because there seems to be a bit, of a, bit of a bit of a trend going on nowadays with some of the legacy brands that maybe have shut down or been brought back or similar type things, taking some of those flagship models and making not so much budget versions, but more sort of like versions focused on more modern sort of playing sensibility. So, for example, uh, Soldano, when Michael shut down the company and then sold off the assets and the designs over to Boutique Amps, they brought it back and they brought out the 30-watt SLO 30, which even here in Australia, we see heaps of them out and about because it's a smaller amp. It's easy to carry around. I was at a gig across the road the other night and there was a guy there playing some weird sort of jazzy folk futuristic punk type stuff and he had an SLO 30 behind him so it's kind of it, it makes a lot more sense to have obviously your big ones for those who kind of want the you know I, I must have the fanciest of the lot like the Ampeg SVT heritage isn't that but then something a bit more reasonable for your common player who wants that sort of tone in the smaller kind of format Definitely, they, you know, these are two different markets. These are there's there's collectors' products, right, and there's and there's players' products, um, and the collectors' products are ones where people have very specific interest in in very specific things, and usually those are um, copying as much as possible some of that um, some of those earlier designs, um, and that tends to be more expensive and it's it's much lower volume, um, and then you have the, the products for players today people just they don't need a 150 watt tube amp that costs five thousand dollars right they need something that they can put in their backpack and they can take to go play a show um, so we want to make sure that we do not one or the other that we do both we think we can cover both markets and that's the whole philosophy behind having uh, some historic and some modern. awesome that definitely sounds very, very sort of promising. So there we have it, people. That's kind of why the Model T is, it's its a future thing. Let's get some other products happening first. You know, let's prove, prove the worthwhile of things and then the nice stuff like that that, everyone's, that everyone says they want and then like five people will actually buy. <laughs> that, that, that's the thing, right? You need some finance behind you to build those products um, and and you need a products that, that are, are going to sell in decent volumes to a, to a modern market and support the needs of those modern players. It's our goal to get Sun back to being one of the top five amp companies in the world, um, and we won't do that selling um, exact replicas of Series 1 Model Ts. I can guarantee you that. So you've got some new new designs and new things on the horizon. Like, so obviously, you know, you've got sort of what you've got there in the historic amps, the two tube heads and the beta lead type thing. You've got the preamp as well with the modern FR, FR type cabinets as well. One thing that, you know, people are probably going to ask about as well is because we live in an era where people are getting those tones, plugging into whatever backline they have, they're using pedals. You've got the beta pre is there something on the horizon in more of a sort of stomp board friendly variant on the sun tonal legacy yeah we're definitely looking at that darius has quite a few prototypes that he's, he's playing with that he may be able to i don't know if he's able to talk about those a, a little bit maybe um but i think we definitely want to see 
the, the sun amp lineage carried on into uh, things that are popular today like uh, pedal board amps and, the, and amp top boxes and those kinds of things. Um, we also have a, a, another member of the team who's not on the call today, another of the, the technical team who's, who's Fess. Um, Fess is a PhD and an expert in uh, artificial intelligence and he and his team have a lot of products in terms of uh, what we can do in software and firmware um, where we can do things like cabinets and he's got some really great sort of ideas about stuff that can be done with uh, amp modeling and cabinet simulation in some, some more uh, sort of amp top box and pedal form factors. Yeah, Fess and I worked on a um, pretty groundbreaking uh, IR product uh, for, for a large company. Um, and by, my background, I started sort of in analog signal processing, you know, building tube amps, radios, op amps and all that, and later moved into digital signal processing. So I'm kind of like a dual domain guy. I like to be able to, you know, take my analog circuits and model them in digital. Um, so as James said, we're, we're prototyping stuff now. It's, it's our vision and goal to have um, the sun sound available like in, in a pedal board friendly format. I, I love pedals. If I can go in with a little fly rig with three pedals on it and get a huge sound plugging into the, the house system or a small, you know, FRFR cabinet, that's, that's, a, that's for me, that's really ideal. And we, we definitely think about serving that market too. And 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 some surprises, uh, you know, things that things will keep, will will keep quiet for now. But uh, sonically, we really like how they sound, and we've we've unearthed some some little gems here and there from from the archives, and uh, uh, hope to introduce that uh, here in the near future. That sounds exciting. It's 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 always it's always great when you've got like sort of interesting things from the past. Maybe people either forget about or sort of like design documents or like limited prototypes or weird things that pop up and go. That should have been a product, you know. As as you guys probably know as well, there was like the big massive archive of the um, Gibson schematics and diagrams and files that they that they found, and like stuff like that to me is absolutely thoroughly interesting because you can kind of see. Well, what 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 could have been? What what might have happened? You know, sometimes products come to market way too early and they just don't work because of that. But then you come back and look at it through a different set of eyes decades later. It's like, oh, yeah, I see. How can we tweak this for today? Right, right. Yeah, that's well. One um, one thing that you'll be seeing more of that we can't too, talk too much about, but um, I'll give you a little teaser. Um, is that you'd mentioned earlier, we've uh, consulted with a lot of the, the, the former Sun folks, um, and we have an advisory board now that's made up of a, a lot of those people who are helping us with those things and have provided us with some original documentation. Um, and one of our most recent members is Steve Sondholm, who's the founder of Sun's Sun, um, and he has access to a lot of historical information that has never been public before. So we're hoping to do something with that. Right. Yeah. And, and Excellent. I mean, that, 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 that'd that be wonderful. I think the other interesting thing for me as a guy who likes looking at schematics and you, you know, doing a lot of repair, you probably see a lot of variations on the theme when you're looking at amp or pedal schematics and all that. The sun stuff, especially the beta, I mean, it's, it's interesting to look at the service bulletin and the schematics um, and, and some of the other products they did. They really don't follow a pattern. And we did meet some of the original engineers and, um, as we guessed, they're more of traditionally schooled engineers that went to work at a music company and took just specifications and built something unique. Um, and the beta is like that. When you look at the tone stack, it's like, wow, what, what kind of a tone stack is this? And I think it was back in the day, I think it was too much for people. They, they, they tweaked it and it didn't quite sound right. And then came, you know, the stoner rock, the doom guys, Kurt Cobain, paired it with a different guitar and realized that I don't want that Marshall sound and cranked it up and created this whole new, you know, genre around that. It's, it's really a, a, a cool thing to see sort of this sonic history evolve through schematics and then, and then hear it on an album. Right. Awesome. Well, you know, it's, it, you know, especially given the unfortunate passing of him recently, you know, it's good to see that the company is back, you know, it's something something that he started pretty much from a garage, building sort of kit type things from the Dynaco, and then growing it from there to something that you know some of the world's biggest stars played on Sun Backline, Sun PA, Sun Amps. 
and to now see him back in the 21st century it's definitely a positive thing for me i like i like seeing companies come back not only with an you know with an eye to the future but with you know a little bit of a glance back towards the past to sort of see where it came from but still focused on today's musicians. So, look, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming along today. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat, and I look forward to hopefully one day seeing one of these products down under so I can pull them apart, take a look at them, and see just what makes them tick inside. Great. Thank you much, Lee. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting Yeah, thanks for having us. (laughs) 